Hi, this is The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi, and today I'm very excited because we have John Latta with us, and he is a remarkable individual, and he talks about how you can heal yourself through dreams. So, John, why don't you tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do? Yeah. Um, thank you, Stacey, and appreciate the invitation being on your show here. Oh, and um, yeah, I think the story I'd like to share today is um, up until about 20 years ago, I was probably a, a fairly typical, rigid, rational, competitive male. <laughs> <laughs> and about 20 years ago, everything in my life started to change. And, um, and I found myself uh, so I wrote a book called The Synchronicity of Love, and my wife thinks the book should have been titled Rigid Rational Male Transforms into Random Accidental Mystic, because <laughs> that has been my journey, and a lot of it does feel random and unexpected, and part of it was um, I, I came into, I started paying attention to my dreams, and I had no idea how multifaceted dreams were and how helpful they could be on what I would call the healing journey. And um, I think a lot of people know that dreams can be helpful for healing past pain, emotional pain, trauma, things like that. But a lot of people might not know that dreams can be really helpful. And in a way, you might say it's the body speaking to you uh, and telling you about certain things that you just might not be aware of. A lot of us just really aren't taught to be really in tune with our body, to really love our body and appreciate our body. And my experience has been if you do that, the body will talk to you yeah. and it will tell you things that maybe you might not notice or even your doctor might not notice. Um, my experience has been every single body is unique. So the more that you can pay attention to your body, the more I think you can realize sort of a, an optimal state of health, healing and harmony. So what happened was uh, 20 years ago, like so many people, uh, I had to go through hell and pain <laughs> that began the the big transformation in my life. I got divorced unexpectedly. Um, I suddenly had custody of my two kids, ages nine and 11. I had left my very secure job, started my own company, lost all of our money and a whole bunch more, it was $650,000 in debt. Um, I had borrowed against everything and was inches away from going bankrupt. And then around that same time, I suddenly had this horrifying fear of death. I don't know where it came from. I'd kind of shoved death to the side for most of my life. And I didn't really have a strong religious or spiritual foundation to fall back on. So uh, this was a lot for me to deal with all at the same time. And so I, I boldly signed up for my first ever spiritual retreat, which was literally like a Nazi skinhead deciding to make friends with his black neighbors. It was that difficult <laughs> for me. But my life kind of felt like I'd hit my own personal rock bottom and I was looking for just to kind of shake myself up a little bit. Well, I went to the retreat out in the desert, which by the way, the, what drew me to this particular retreat was Michael Crichton, the author who I adored and had all his books and read all his books, uh, went through his own sort of midlife crisis. And one of the things he did was he decided to go to his first ever spiritual retreat. And it was the same retreat and the same teacher, I went 20 years after Michael Crichton, and it was almost all the same things being taught. So that was really cool. And that's what gave me kind of the courage to do it. Uh, I was taught by a very eminent Southern California physician. And, um, but one of the things he talked about, he, he felt dreams were sacred and he wanted of us all to pay attention to our dreams. And he gave us an exercise right at the beginning. And it goes for this whole retreat. And if you ideally for the rest of your life, I want you to put a pen and a notebook or a recording device next to your bed. And as you fall asleep at night, um, here's a little exercise to help you uh, remember a dream. And he said, imagine uh, you get in bed, you've got your recording device or your pen and notebook next to your bed, and you feel yourself drifting off to sleep. Imagine yourself uh, walking up to the edge of, say, the Grand Canyon, where there's some grand, deep abyss far below you, taking off all your clothes, turning around and standing backwards with your back to the abyss. And as you fall asleep, fall backwards into the abyss, this is taking place in your mind's eye, mm -hmm. uh, in total trust and ask for a dream. And it's just that simple. So I started doing that. And after a few days, I had a little snippet of a dream, maybe just three seconds long. And then after a few weeks, suddenly I had dreams just flooding forth. And so anybody that does dream work will tell you the first challenge is remembering the dream because a lot of people don't remember the dreams or they slip through your fingers so quickly. Right. The second challenge is even if you can record it, it's like, what in the world is this Alice in Wonderland mess have anything to do with my life? You know what I mean? 
And so trying to interpret and understand your dreams, it can take time. And so I joined a dream forum. I started asking for dreams and I, I posted dreams and I posted what was going on in my life. And a lot of really wise people helped me. And at first I was like, what in the world? How are you getting that from this dream? And so I learned too, that while dreams don't speak to us literally, they usually speak to us symbolically. And one of the best ways to work with dreams is with intuition. And so it really requires more of a light intuitive touch than a literal logical. Well, I have a literal logical mind. So that was another challenge for me, nice. but I stuck with it and I stuck with it and I stuck with it. And what started to happen over time was I started to discern that while well, most dreams are of what I would just call a psychological nature, sometimes it's just your psyche trying to make sense of what happened during the day. There's an entire spectrum of dreams that goes way beyond just the typical normal dream. And so um, the first healing story I want to share with you was um, about a year after I joined that dream forum and was paying attention to my dreams. Well, at that period of time, I had six straight years of chronic neck pain. Now, I had been in a car crash. I had gotten off an off-ramp on the freeway and stopped. And the guy behind me apparently didn't see me stopping and just plowed into me from behind. So a classic whiplash-type neck pain. Uh, and I didn't go to the doctor because I was a tough guy. And over time, it started to become chronic. And it got to be so bad that I couldn't get through my day. And I, I tried everything. I tried physical therapy, massage, uh, ultrasound, uh, acupuncture, chiropractic, um, I got books on neck pain. I followed all the exercises faithfully. I, I went so far as to finally, uh, I, I had surgery where they put me under and put um, cortisone injections between the facet joints of my neck. Nothing worked. I remember waking up from that surgery and my neck still hurt. And I thought, oh my God, I can't believe I'm going to live this way for the rest of my life. Mind you, I got a stand-up desk at work. I sat on a bouncy ball at work. I tried <laughs> everything, but by noon, the pain was just ferocious. Well, I go home from work early one day, right before my kids get off the school bus and I take a little nap and I curl up in a fetal position in tears, <clears throat> excuse me. And I say, excuse my French, Stacy, why, <laughs> why the fuck does my neck hurt so bad? Yeah. And instantly I have this hyper vivid dream of a monk and he's pacing back and forth outside my house. That's the dream. So again, I'm new to dream work and I'm like, what in the world does that monk pacing outside my house have anything to do with my neck pain? So I got in the dream forum and you know, again, there's some half a dozen really wise people. And I remember the leader saying, John, that dream has everything to do with your neck pain. I'm like, oh, come on. You know, I don't get it. Explain it. Yeah. And he goes, well, what does a monk symbolize? Why does a monk shave their head? Why do they wear a robe? Why do you suppose he's pacing outside your house rather than why is he not inside your house? And what he said was, I want you to open to this idea, John, that you actually have a very spiritual side, like a selfless monk, you might say. And, um, and the idea is sometimes with dream work and wholeness and things like that is to allow him into your house instead of pushing him out. And so I tried to open to this idea, which mind you, again, after 40 some years of being anti-spiritual, that was a big leap for me. Right. Another month goes by, I have another dream. And now this great healer is coming towards me and he's got his hand out like a, like an energy healer and he's reaching for my neck. And in the dream, I'm like, oh my God, thank God, somebody's coming to heal my neck. And as he puts his hand over my neck, uh, an angry old man who lives in my neck, uh, and excuse my French again, Stacy, <laughs> says, get the fuck away end of dream. And so what started to become clear over time was, I know it sounds funny, but um, people carry resistance in certain parts of their body. Yes. I was going through a period of time where every day I was one day away from bankruptcy and just desperate to like, oh my God, I'm going to have to uproot my kids, start all over. How am I going to do that? Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? And, uh, and again, running around behind closed doors, terrified of death and, you know, just still dealing with being a single dad in custody of two kids. I was resisting a lot. And I, you know, I learned that um, people tend to carry resistance when they're resisting parts of their life in their head, their neck, their shoulders, their upper back, their lower back, or their stomach. Those seem to be the, the big six. Mm -hmm. Well, I carried it all in my neck. And when I started to become conscious and aware that I'm resisting people and situations in my life, this like steel rod, like rebar in my neck was happening. And so I had to learn 
to relax and not carry that tension and that resistance in my neck. At the same time, open to this possibility that maybe I'm a very spiritual being. Right. And so honestly, Stacey, two more years went by, but then came the, the culminating dream where that same, he was like a Tibetan monk who was pacing outside my house. I have a dream and he's standing right next to me in my office. His heart is pierced and wide open and he's just smiling at me with such love. And I suddenly realized my neck didn't hurt again. And it, it's never hurt since. I mean, other than just usual stuff, maybe bad posture in front of the computer or something. Right. And so that's a, that's a long story. But um, I started to learn like, wow, dreams can really, I mean, because a lot of people say dreams are about making the unconscious conscious. And if you really study it, it's actually shocking how little we're actually conscious of or aware of. And so... Um, so yeah, six years of chronic neck pain gone. All those trips to the doctor, <laughs> yeah, the pills, the surgery, the cortisone, everything, waste of time and money. All I had to learn to do was not to resist certain aspects of my life and not carry that resistance in my neck. So that was beautiful and that was encouraging. Um, I'll share, um, you want to uh, jump in anytime if you want to interrupt me. No, um, I'm, I'm very intrigued by your story. Okay. I didn't want to interrupt you. I, okay, you know, well, and I'll share two, two more. Um, this one's much simpler. So I have a body that runs hot all the time, kind of one of those guys that runs around shorts and a t-shirt in winter all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in Seattle, 99% of the homes don't have air conditioning because generally we just don't need them. And I live in a big, long rambler with a lot of skylights and a lot of glass. So when it is hot outside, it's like a giant greenhouse in the house. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I was having one particular summer where I was just suffering and moping around the house, like no energy. Oh my God, I'm so hot. I'm so miserable. And I took a little nap and I had this dream come through about taking turmeric, the Indian spice, you know, and I'm mm -hmm. like the Indian spice, that, that orange stuff. So I look it up online. It says turmeric nature's anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. So I went and bought a bottle of turmeric at the grocery store and came back and started sprinkling it on my breakfast, lunch, dinner, my water and everything. And it probably took two or three days and actually was shocked at how it had a remarkably cooling effect on the body. Yeah. So another example where instead of a trip to the doctor or instead of going and sitting in an ice bath all the time, you know, you might say the body or some greater wisdom in me was like, hey, you know, here's what you can do to kind of help keep your body harmonized, cool and comfortable. Um, okay, one more story I want to share. Um, okay. And this, this gets even a little more woo woo. <laughs> and um, so again, the more I started to pay attention to my dreams, and in some way, directly and indirectly pay attention to my body, the more it felt like my body was speaking back to me and saying, you know, here's ways that you can support me. So um, I used to own a company and I used to fly all the time and probably you know, maybe 25 times a year. And I had to fly from Seattle to Jacksonville, Florida with a connection in Dallas um, for an 8 a.m. appointment the following morning and then fly all the way back right after the appointment. And um, the day before my trip, I throw my back out and mm. oh my God, I'm just, I'm just, I get up the next morning hoping for a miracle, no dice. My back hurts, it's stiff. And all I could think of is sitting in an uncomfortable airline seat. This is gonna be the worst trip ever because my experience has been when I've thrown my back out, two things help it, gentle stretching and walking, but mm -hmm. sitting in uncomfortable chairs is just murder. Yeah. So I drive to the airport. I literally have to reach up to the roof of my car and kind of hoist myself up and out. I go and get in line and I'm, you know, three people away from handing my boarding pass and driver's license to this TSA agent. And all of us, and I'm stealing myself for this. This is going to be tough. Just got to get through it. When you get home tomorrow night, you know, you can, uh, you can start stretching and rehab and, you know, and, and all of a sudden I'm aware of some other part of me is humming the tune. Don't worry, be happy <laughs> in me and aiming the vibrations of the song to my lower back. And I sat there like in this twilight zone, this like your choice, John, do you want to sing to your back or do you want to grumble about how bad it's going to be? <laughs> right. And I did know loosely at that stage of my life that sound and vibration could be healing. And so I was like, hmm. So the nice thing about airports and airplanes is with all the ambient noise, you can hum away and nobody notices that you're humming the same song <laughs> over and over again. So I hummed the chorus, the main part of the song, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Um, 
in the airport all the way to Dallas, uh, all the way from Dallas to Jacksonville, in my rental car, in my hotel, even over dinner with my sales team that night. Mm -hmm. And and, and it, it was hysterical. I felt like I was getting some grand tests from the universe because all of my seats were window seats and mm -hmm. everybody who sat in the middle seat next to me was impossibly large. And so, you know, I was pinned over against the window and this, you know, oh my God, this is going to be terrible. But no, I just kept humming. My pain steadily went down. And by the time I got back the next night, my pain, which on a scale of one to 10 started as a six, and I was sure was going to be a nine at the end of the trip was a one. Wow. And, and so, you know, it's funny. And I, I have used that trick on more than one occasion. Uh, my wife and I took a three month trip right before COVID hit and drove from Seattle to Florida and just Airbnb it all the way there and back. You know, there was a lot of driving a few times. My rear end was tired and my legs were kind of stiff and back yeah. and I would start to grumble about it. And then I just like, wow, just sing. And it, it immediately 50% of the discomfort goes away as soon as I'm humming a happy song. And, um, and so, you know, again, another, I, I like to share the story, like I, you know, one of the ways we learn is through experience. And so I like to share the story. If you're four years old and you get mauled, viciously bitten by a big black dog, it's entirely possible for the rest of your life. You're going to be a cat person right? <laughs> or an anti-animal person or an anti-dog person, or have terror around dogs or big black dogs. Right. And, and that might be how we live our life for a period of time. And so again, going back when I was younger, I did a lot of heavy lifting and it was kind of normal to throw my back out once in a while. So I had this history and memory of what happens when you throw your back out. Okay. Got to take it easy. Got to stretch. Don't sit in uncomfortable chairs, you know, do static back laying on the floor stretch. And so that's how I always did it. But I think what I love about um, paying attention to dreams is it keeps teaching me over and over again. Okay. That's how you used to do it. Right. But maybe now you can do it a different way. And it takes right. a little, almost setting aside your ego, setting aside your pride, setting aside the, the comfort that there is of always doing things the same way. Right. And now we're going to try doing something completely different. Like who the heck thought I could heal my back by humming to it on an airplane. Right. <laughs> 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 and so, um, yeah, so I, I think what I would encourage your listeners and everybody is um, there's a lot more to dreams than I think we know and right. uh, encourage everybody to go through the learning curve of taking the time to write it down, taking the time maybe to join a dream form or read some books. Um, it's not usually effective to uh, analyze mm -hmm. a dream with you know, there are dream dictionaries, like, you know, if you see a crow, it means this, if you see a, an elephant, it means this, you know, right, because dreams can be, I think they're uniquely tied to your psyche, your life, and maybe not just this life, but your many past lives as well. Yes. And so symbols will come through that mean something particular to you, but maybe not to the general public. Right. So it's a little like learning Chinese, another language of symbols. But if you can get through that, um, there's an unbelievable amount of uh, resources available to you through dreams. Now, did you did you always have, you know, do you think you always get in these dreams and these messages? You just didn't pay attention to it. Or when you opened yourself up to the universe, then your dreams started coming in. The, the messages started coming in. You just at first didn't understand it. But you, yeah. you, did you think it was one or the other? I think it was probably both. I mean, nobody taught me there was any value in paying attention to them. And I, you know, if you talked about all the dreams you remember, I remember having a few scary dreams like nightmares when I was a kid or a teenager. Um, and, um, but I just don't think anybody said, Hey, pay attention to your dreams, write them down. So I just would wake up. Oh, it was a dream and go about my life. I didn't know there was any jewels there. Right. Um, so, but I think it's both the other, you know, I did, purposely, like you said, open to the universe, ask the universe, I, I want to pay attention to my dreams. And um, yeah, it's, uh, I wrote a chapter in a book called the spectrum of dreams. And I came up with like probably 15 different kinds of dreams. It's wow. not just the usual stuff. Um, God, it's just, you know, I'll share a dream that somebody else had that I love. So one of my favorite dream books is, um, although it's not specifically about dreams, but talks a lot uh, Dr. Judith Orloff has written a lot of interesting books. 
Um, and one of my favorite is called Second Sight. And she's kind of woven her, uh, her history growing up. Uh, now she, on the other hand, did come into this life very psychic, very awake, um, had a lot of profound dreams from earliest childhood. But she shared a dream where, so she later in life became a medical doctor, was a psychiatrist, and she um, started a business practice with a guy. And so they were business partners. But as time went on, uh, they had very different ideas about how their business should be run. But she wasn't comfortable confronting people, talking to them directly. Mm -hmm. And so she would smile every time she was random, but behind closed doors, she was seething with rage. And so she has this really profound dream where this giant forest fire is chasing her and she's running as fast as she can and she can feel the heat on her back and it's almost going to consume her. And then this very quiet, wise, neutral voice comes through the dream and just says, you know, if you turn around and face the fire, it won't hurt you. And so in the dream, she turns around, whoosh, just quickly disappears into just like smoldering ash. And she knew that that fire was her rage. And she knew she needed just, again, remember I said dreams sometimes require an intuitive touch. Yes. That doesn't mean necessarily a real forest fire is about to come get her. Right. And so she knew she needed to go talk to her business partner and it was uncomfortable and it was hard for her, but she did. And everything got resolved after that. So I've had other dreams and experiences about similar things. And it's sort of cliche to say, you know, face your fears, but there's enormous gold in having the courage to face your fears. And I think if you don't, they sometimes can show up as nightmares and dreams, <clears throat> really okay. scary dreams. Now, do you keep a notebook by your bed? To yeah. yeah. I'm old school. Some people like to record on their phones, but I still, I like the, I like the process of just writing. There's something right. lulling about the writing. Yeah. Because <laughs> I find, you know, you only remember the dream for the first few minutes, you know, when you have a dream and, you know, and then all of a sudden it starts to fade out. So uh -huh. having something, either a phone or a notebook could probably be very beneficial because yeah. for some reason we tend to forget it after the first few minutes after we wake. Sometimes it's more like the first few seconds, like yeah. you have to yeah. just grab it quick. Like it does sometimes feel like water running through your fists. You're trying to hold on to it. It's like, no, come back. <laughs> um, I don't have a really good answer for that. Uh, I don't know anybody that doesn't go through that. And every dream is different. Some it's powerful enough that it's like, okay, I'm not going to forget this dream. But right. yeah, most dreams, if you don't record them really quickly, they'll slip away. And how did you learn it for someone who wants to start interpreting their dreams and wants to pay more attention to, you know, help heal their body and heal their mind through yeah. dreams? How, what's the process? How would they go about that? You know, how would they start learning about their dreams if they write it down or, you know, if they remember the dream, but they don't understand the interpretation, what's yeah. the process of getting to the point where you could understand what your body, what the universe is trying to tell you? Well, I think the first thing is uh, to be patient with yourself. Uh, the second thing is write them down, record them somehow. The funny thing is, if you start to do it regularly, you will start to see certain patterns going on in your life. And so if you tied it into maybe astrology, you will see certain archetypes at play in your life and in your dreams. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I'm not saying for one second that it's easy. I do think that people who are, uh, move through the world intuitively will take to dream work much quicker and much easier. Those mm -hmm. rigid, rational, masculine types, it's a longer learning curve. <laughs> um, and so, um, there's some excellent authors on dreams. Uh, Robert Moss is probably, he's made a whole career out of dream work and dream mm -hmm. books. I think that's a good place to start. I think joining dream groups, uh, there's lots of groups online now, some are better than others. And so, in the early days, um, you know, you may have people telling you what your dreams mean, and they might be frankly wrong, right. but that's okay. It's part of the learning curve. But I, I think, you know, when you see yourself in the, you'll start to see that your story, like there's your life story in dreams. You know, they say, if you really want to get to know somebody, uh, talk to them about your dreams, because dreams will show you all of who you are with unvarnished honesty. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like the ultimate revealer. And that's why a lot of people don't like to work with dreams. It's too vulnerable. Yeah. And we tend to, because we all have egos, we all have personalities. We tend to glom onto certain aspects about ourselves that we like or identify with and take certain other ones that are there and sweep them under the rug and pretend like they're not there. Right. But you'll see them in your dreams. I hate to say it. You're yeah. not going to be able to run from it. And, um, and so yeah, I would say dream groups, dream forums, uh, dream books. But the main thing is get used to writing your dreams because pretty soon you'll realize this is my language for me. And the really cool thing about dreams is, um, oh, you can be doing the same thing over and over and over again in a dream. And all of a sudden the day comes where suddenly you do something completely different in the dream. And the weird thing is uh, dreams can be a reflection of what's ultimately starts to take place in your outer life as well. Right. So in a way it kind of gives you a sneak preview for what's coming in your life. And again, I I'm tying it just very loosely to astrology, but you know, if you study astrology, you know, astrologer will say, you know, time is not linear time moves in cycles and, uh, and things will change over time. And so in some ways it's like getting an inner, astrology reading it's right. almost like if you go if you really pay attention to your dreams and go sit with an astrologer they're not going to tell you anything about yourself you don't know already right right yeah so yeah it's very it's multifaceted it's beautiful i i sometimes don't understand uh how it all works uh some have said if you there literally is a book called dream yoga and there actually is a path to you might call it enlightenment that goes through dreams and they will tell you the path for almost everybody is when you start you're on the surface and you're working with your unconscious but you burrow deeply into your deeper unconscious and mm -hmm. into what they call the substrate and then what usually happens is after you've worked with that for a while you suddenly find yourself in the realm of divine beings angels um, guides ascended masters and there's all this wisdom that's available to you, you know, yes. and, and, um, and then if you go really deep in the like Tibetan tradition, you end up at, I think what they call the clear light mind, or just what some might call God or source, you know, right. you keep following your dreams. It's like, it's like going inward deeper and deeper and deeper. And so behind the psyche, behind the ego, behind the conscious and the unconscious mind is the infinite. Right. And so that's another, you know, and then on a purely practical level, like helping you heal your body, helping heal, I think sometimes emotional pain and past pain. Um, there's a whole creative aspect to dreams where, you know, if you're in any kind of a career or life that requires uh, some kind of creativity, I, my experience with dreams is you're infinitely more creative and infinitely more resourceful in every single situation. Right. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Now you talk about the um, forums that you went to. So if someone mm -hmm. is, you know, just started and they're, they're, they're they they want to learn how to heal their body through dreams and they want to learn the power of dreams and how to utilize it in their life. What forums did you use that maybe you could suggest to others, you know, in the beginning when they're trying to interpret their dreams and some, you know, they're not understanding quite what the yeah. message is. Um, well, the only forum that I participated in regularly was uh, that same physician that the retreat I went to 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, his name was Dr. William Brew Joy, MD, and he just went by his middle name Brew, but he passed away uh, okay. about a decade ago. But a number of very uh, talented uh, dream artists, you might say, are still on that forum, some really, really good ones. Uh, you can find them on Facebook, and I think it's just called Brew Joy Dream Forum. There's about 500 members in it. Oh wow! And um, it's not as active since the, uh, the since the founder passed, um, but there are some really wise people there. Um, I, anything connected with Robert Moss, I think, would be the next place I would go to. And I I'm not familiar with his forums, but I'm sure they're there. Right. Yeah. That you know they do have a lot of good. Um groups on Facebook, you know, yeah. some of them, you know, you might go in and you might feel it's not for you, but if you search around, you know, sometimes you can feel, you know, you, you know, when you're in a good group and you know, when there's wise and individuals there, and sometimes you have to find that perfect group. That's just for you. And then even yeah. some of the authors you mentioned, just getting their books maybe and, and dipping into their books, taking the time to read through it, you know, would help them also. 
I agree. I, I One of the things that's helped me a lot just understanding dreams is just reading books about dreams where over and over and over again, they share a dream and what they got of it, what the message was, what the wisdom was, what the guidance was. And you just start to get familiar with that. And pretty soon it, your dreams will start to make sense as well. Right. And I, like I said, I would say if you're primarily, primarily linear, logical, masculine, left-brained, it might take longer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> if you are kind of trust your intuition and you, you know, sometimes this big, long, elaborate dream, your intuition will tell you exactly what the dream's about in just mere seconds. You don't have to go through it line by line and trying to figure it all out. Right. Um, ideal, I think you'd kind of merge the two, but I think if you are intuitive, you'll be able to move through this learning curve a lot quicker. Right. Yeah, I agree with you. I, you know, the more you're open, I think when you are open to the, what the universe has to tell you, I think it it's, it comes to you easier. You know, the and you when you let when you let the universe in, more messages come through because yeah. you know you're kind of opening those gates and letting them in, and then you know they're they're giving you the angels, the guides, the spirits, the you know they're they're sending you messages, and and when you talk about intuition, it could be through dreams, it could be through sounds, it could be through yeah. you know there have been times when I've had dreams that I've heard people's voices like they were that have passed and they're talking to me in my in my ear, I could hear them clear as day, just like they were sitting down on, on the bed right next to me, and I'd wake up and there'd be no one there. <laughs> but they had this whole conversation. But like you said, I only remembered that conversation for the first few seconds. And then I just remember a couple of bits and pieces and that was it. And I, I remember there was one time and it was a, a great, great grandmother of mine. She loved lavender and she had just passed. And right before I went to bed, I said, just give me a sign that you're okay. And when I was sleeping, she, I, it was right before I woke up, she goes, she used to use the word love all the time. She goes, mm -hmm. I'm okay, love. And, <laughs> and I woke up and she loved lavender. The room smelt of lavender, and but there was no lavender in my room at the moment. So, you know, but I could smell a strong, strong sense of lavender. And it's amazing how the universe, how the spirits, you know, will come to you and will give you signals. And even the, those people can give you signals and people you love that have passed too. I love that. And thank you for sharing all that. Um, yeah. Two things I want to say about that. One is, um, it is true that not everybody's visual, or if they are, they're not visual to the same degree. And so uh, people can get all sorts of messages from the universe through feeling levels, through hearing. Um, you, know, it, you know, you probably heard the term, you know, it's like a download. Suddenly, you know, you have no idea how you know, you just know. Mm -hmm. and, so, um, and so when I say dreams, I'm kind of really referring to all of that. So opening yourself to messages from the universe or from guys that may or may not come through visions. Now, some people like me are highly visual, although I know people that are more visual than I am. Mm -hmm. and they get almost everything through vision. Um, so I think I've kind of gotten all of them. Uh, you know, I've definitely had really good guidance streams through just voices, Yeah. you know, and you know, and, um, now oh, there was something else I was going to say about that. Um, oh, you know, the other thing I, I forget sometimes, but the other beautiful thing about working with dreams is you can ask, if you think of dreams as not only your body, but your, your wise higher self, right. um, you can ask a question. And if it doesn't seem like the kind of thing you could get an answer on your own intuitively, uh, Judith Orloff, the one I told you that wrote that book, Second Sight, she goes, mm -hmm. I would write my question on a piece of paper and put it under my pillow and literally sleep on it. And eventually, maybe that night, maybe in three nights, the answers would start to come. Wow. And so that's another thing. I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, you know, sort of indirectly, like yeah. you can ask for guidance and allow it to come through dreams. But like I said, it may come that first night. It might not come till the third or fourth night, but keep the question present, fall asleep with it and see if the guidance doesn't come forth for you. I like that. I, that's a great idea. I like yeah. that a lot. Now yeah. you had told me that you have written a book recently. Can you tell me mm -hmm. a little about the, the book and what it's about? Yeah. So the book is called The Synchronicity of Love. Uh, came out middle of last year. 
Um, it's 119 short true stories uh, of the last 20 years of my life, some of which we've talked about today. Mm -hmm. uh, they cover the whole dang spectrum of spirituality. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I could do a whole nother show on two years into my journey. I came into a full on Kundalini awakening and I had no idea what the word meant or what the heck was going on with me. Mm -hmm. So I had all sorts of long, exotic, strange experiences with um, energy. So, and I, I kind of wrote it for all you, it's not just men, rigid, rational people out there that think you know it all, but you're feeling <laughs> a stuck. It's kind of like, it's okay to open yourself up a little bit. And, um, and I, I like to use the analogy. I think we all big build houses of, you might call them brick walls and the walls might be our identity and our beliefs. And there's a comfort with those walls around us. Mm -hmm. But I think later in life, it's okay to start to dismantle those walls a little bit because we're missing a lot. Yeah. And, um, and I told it in a format that I like, I learn best when other people share their stories rather than mm -hmm. sort of a dry academic jargon that goes on and on. I like to hear people's actual experiences. And so that's mostly what the book is about. Oh, like uh, the that. title came from the minute I signed up for that dang retreat, I started having synchronicities and I get back then, I just called them coincidences. Like, yeah, wow, that was a coincidence, you know, and I had a you know really sharp math mind. So I kept thinking, wow, what are the chances of that happening? <laughs> <laughs> and it kept happening over and over and over again. And so the retreat was focused on um, heart centered meditation, um, unconditional love in the heart. From that, we worked a lot with dreams. And, you know, for me, the more I stay with my heart, the more magical synchronicity start to happen in my life. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Now, where can they find that book? Um, Synchronicity of Love, Stories that Heal, Transform, and Awaken is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and I just found it recently, Target and Walmart too. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Now you also have a website. Can you tell us a little about your website and some of the things that you have on your website? Yeah. Um, my website is johndavidlatta.com. L-A-T-T-A is my last name. Um, I have information about me. I'm uh, an author spiritual teacher, uh, used to teach a lot of groups um, in person, then COVID hit. <laughs> <laughs> and literally just uh, two weeks ago, started teaching groups in person again. I'm going to start doing that more in person. I have a blog uh, with some interesting stories on there. Um, in fact, I, I just, I think I'm loading a dozen more little odd short stories today. And, um, and some of those short stories, interestingly, came to me through dreams. I actually found a very uh, pleasant to take a dream where I feel like I really got the nugget of wisdom from the dream and tried right. to just, just tweak a few words here, a few things to make it just a little one page short story. Yeah. And, um, and there's some other really odd experiences there in my blog that you see, there's probably uh, 15 or 20 blog posts and stories there. Oh, wow. That sounds very yeah. interesting. I like that. I yeah. like that a lot. I, yeah. I got to tell you, John, it's been a pleasure, you know, having you here. And before we go, if, um, can you give some, like maybe three or four tips to people, people who want to start using dreams to heal their mind and body, yeah. what, you know, some easy ways just to begin. Yeah. The first thing I would think of is, you know, you kind of talked earlier about, you know, guides and beings and angels. The first thing I would say is going with the mindset that the universe is abundant and wants to help. I just have to ask. So that was, that's the first thing is the mindset is like, hmm, there's probably more out there than I'm aware of. I'm open to being helped here. Uh, number two, and again, for me, most of that comes through dreams. Um, number two, that exercise I talked about earlier about having a recording device, a pen, pencil, notebook, something. It's like, this is my intention. I want to make my unconscious conscious. So much of the time when you try to do simple things like lose weight or quit drinking, it's because our conscious mind or unconscious mind are not in alignment. Yeah. And sometimes shining a light on what's going on unconsciously, you know, it, you'd be amazed how many times it's just something as simple as, and, and as difficult as low self-worth. I'm not enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not doing enough. I'm not worthy of love unless I do something. Just little unconscious messages that are really driving everything. Right. And, and that will come through in dreams, uh, both the most beautiful and the most horrifying can come through dreams. So you got to have a little yeah. courage too. 
So uh, the exercise I talked about falling asleep at night and allowing yourself to sort of fall backwards into the abyss and asking for a dream. Um, I think it's very helpful to work with the heart center and it can be as simple as just placing your hand with reverence over your heart, touching yourself. It's very subtle, but uh, the idea is to get out of your ego into something larger. And so it's, it's a very subtle thing, but it's sort of like you're in the state of compassion and unconditional love and non-judgment. Right. Because when dreams come forward, most of us don't like some of the dreams that come forward. Oh crap. Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> I don't want to see that. Yeah. But you know, you know, if you could magically transform yourself into a state of compassion and unconditional love, you can greet anything. And that's the thing. Get out of your mind, get into your heart, relax, and know that whatever comes forth is going to be beneficial. And trust me, most of what comes forth, I think is beautiful, amazing, but there's sometimes difficult stuff that comes forth too. And it's just something uh, that needs to be healed. wants to be transformed, something you just need to move through. And on yeah. the other side is the beginning of a, a new way of seeing the world. <clears throat> I love it. I love it. That's yeah. great. I got to tell you, you, this has been a great experience and I love everything you had to say. And I wish you the best of luck with your book that you recently published. Yeah. And, you know, I, yeah, I hope, you know, you can come back on the show and we can talk some more because you seem like you have a lot of really knowledgeable information that you could pass along to people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love the topic. So, oh, thank you, you know. so much. Oh, yeah, you're very welcome. It. Yeah. You know, thank, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate, you know, your time. You know, this has been a great experience. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. All right. You have a great day. You too. Thank you.